Based on the experimental observations of black body radiation, photoelectric effect, Compton effect, pair production, it became clear that light is composed of these discrete packets of energy or corpuscles or photons. This is known as the photon picture of radiation in which light is composed of these particles called photons. And every single of these photon contains an energy that is given by E equals H nu. Now, what is interesting is that even in this photon picture of radiation, the energy of a photon is given by H nu, where H is a Planck's constant and nu is the frequency. Frequency is a wave property, a wave characteristic. So the question arises, what is light really? Is it a photon, a particle that can interact with other particles? just like particles interact? Or is it a wave that oscillates and propagates through space? Because light still satisfies properties like interference, diffraction, polarization. And these phenomena of interference, diffraction, and polarization can only be explained by its wave characteristic. But at the same time, it also demonstrates behaviors like black body radiation, uh, photoelectric effect, Compton effect that can be explained by this photon picture of radiation. So the question is, what is light really? Is it a wave or is it a particle? This split personality of light is what is today known as the dual nature of light. Yes, the dual nature of light. You see, this is not a mistake. This is not some exception. This is a general manner in which light behaves that in certain circumstances it demonstrates wave properties wave characteristics and in certain circumstances it behaves like a particle this is how light truly is so now the question is the universe is composed of particles and radiation now radiation has demonstrated dual nature so do particles also have dual nature? Do traditional particles also behave in some wavy fashion? Well, the first time, the very first time this was proposed, uh, we did not have any kind of an experimental evidence to support it, but based on arguments of philosophy, arguments of a grand symmetry in our universe, it was proposed for the very first time by a physicist known as Louis De Broglie. Louis de Broglie, but uh, that is how we pronounce it. But uh, he was a French scientist, and the way to pronounce his name is Louis de Broglie. He was a history student who was very much attracted to these questions. Uh, these philosophical questions about physics and nature at that point in time. And he, in 1924, in his doctoral thesis, proposed that just like photons or just like light has a dual nature, particles, traditional particles like electrons, also have a dual nature. That electrons also behave like particles in some circumstances and waves in other circumstances. And we can figure out what is the wavelength of that kind of a particle or a matter wave based on our understanding of the relationships of a photon. So for example, the energy of a photon is given by E equals H nu, right? And the momentum of a photon is given by E is equal to or P is equal to E upon C. Right, so if I substitute E is equal to H nu here, this becomes H nu upon C. But what is nu upon C? Nu upon C is 1 upon lambda because C upon nu is lambda. So this comes out to be H upon lambda. So you see that for a photon at least, the relationship between the momentum of a photon and the wavelength is given by this. That the momentum of a photon is inversely correlated with the wavelength of a photon. What Louis de Broglie suggested was that even for particles, so the de Broglie hypothesis suggests that for 
particles like electrons, protons, neutrons, even atoms, this kind of a relationship holds true. That means even particles have a wave associated with its motion and the wavelength of that matter wave, okay? So if I can call it as such, if I can say matter wave, if a particle has a wave associated with it, let me call it a matter wave, then the wavelength of that matter wave is given by lambda is equal to h upon p. This is the de Broglie hypothesis that just like light has a dual nature of its own, behaves like a wave, behaves like a particle sometimes, and these relationships hold true for light photon. In that same fashion, even particles or matter has this kind of a dual nature, that it has a certain momentum associated with its motion, and it also has a wavelength associated with the matter wave associated with its motion and the wavelength and the momentum are inversely correlated. So the wave property is inversely correlated with the particle property. So the duality of waves and particles that is demonstrated by radiation is not some exception but in fact it is a general characteristic of particles and waves in this universe. Since the universe is composed of particles and waves, both waves and particles demonstrate this kind of a dual behavior that is what de Broglie has suggested. All right. Now the question is, if particles do indeed have this kind of a wave nature, why don't we see that in our day-to-day -day life? I mean, I have this, these objects in my hands, right? They are particles, right? Why don't they demonstrate wave behavior? Well, the answer to that question comes if we actually start making measurements. So let's look at this expression in a little bit more detailed fashion. All right. So the expression given by Louis de Broglie is lambda is equal to h upon p. So what is p? p is momentum. If I write what momentum is for particles that are not traveling at very high speeds, it is simply mv. But what if particles are traveling at very high speeds? So first let's look at relativistic case. In the case of relativistic scenario, the momentum actually comes out to be what? p is equal to gamma m not v where gamma is the gamma factor 1 upon root over 1 minus v square upon c square and hence the lambda is actually equal to h upon gamma m not v and for uh, non-relativistic cases the momentum p square upon 2m is equal to the kinetic energy right so we can write the uh, de Broglie wavelength as lambda is equal to h upon root over 2m kinetic energy. So this is the original equation, but you can represent this as either this for non-relativistic cases or this for non-relativistic cases or this for relativistic cases. Now, let us do a comparison. Okay, let us do a comparison between two particles. On one hand, I have a macroscopic object. I have a golf ball in my hand. It's definitely made up of particles, all right? So this is probably, I don't know, maybe 100 grams, all right? So let's say I have a golf ball, okay, whose mass is 100 grams, and maybe I throw it, all right? I throw it at some speed of, let's suppose, uh, 100 meters per second. Then what is going to be the de Broglie wavelength associated with the matter wave corresponding to the motion of this golf ball through air. So if I calculate that, it comes out to be, what is h? h is a Planck constant 6.626 into 10 to the power minus 34 joules second divided by mass is 100. So 100 times 10 to the power minus 3 into velocity is 100. So this comes out to be around 6. 6.626 into 10 to the power minus 35 meters. 6.626 into 10 to the power minus 35 meters. I'll just keep that here. Let me do another calculation first. The second is electron. So let's suppose I have an electron. I don't have an electron in my hand. I mean, I do have electrons in my hand, but I'm not carrying it like this ball because it's too small to carry, <laughs> okay? So electron, it has a mass of, 
around 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 kgs and let's suppose the electron is also traveling with the same velocity okay v equals so it's a non-relativistic scenario 100 meter per second is very low compared to the speed of light so what is the lambda in that situation the lambda in that situation comes out to be h upon mv so if i again rewrite these values divided by 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 multiplied by 100 meters per second so this comes out to be i think i have already done my calculation somewhere here this comes out to be somewhere around 7.3 into 10 to the power minus 6 meters now two particles a golf ball and an electron both traveling at the velocity of 100 meter per second one has a de Broglie wavelength of 10 to the minus 35 meters the other has a de Broglie wavelength of a few micrometers you see whenever we want to uh, calculate the wavelength of anything any wave then we need some instrument some device that has an aperture or some sort of a opening or an obstacle whose size is of the same order as that of the wavelength now usually we are very capable of detecting wavelengths of this particular order you see even light visible light has a wavelength of around 4000 5000 6000 angstroms right if you look at x-rays they have wavelength of few hundred angstroms right if you look at gamma radiation maybe few angstroms or even less than that right so we are capable of detecting radiation which has wavelength of this particular order 10 to the power minus 6 up to maybe 10 to the power minus 11 even 10 to the power minus 12 meters right but if you make this comparison with this number 10 to the power minus 35 that is extremely small that is extremely extremely tiny it is in fact so tiny that there is no instrument or device that can actually measure that I mean if you look at an atom even the nucleus of this is of the size of around 10 to the power minus 15 meters 10 to the power minus 15 meters so this wavelength is many orders of magnitude smaller than even a nucleus we don't have any instrument or a device to actually measure this kind of a wavelength so therefore whenever we deal with macroscopic particles uh, we don't really see the wave characteristic of those macroscopic particles whenever I have a ball I throw a ball I don't really see any kind of a interference phenomena or diffraction phenomena associated with the motion of this ball because the wavelength associated with this is so tiny that is almost negligible however when we do go into the microscopic domain where we encounter electrons protons neutrons even atoms they in certain situations do demonstrate wave behavior wave characteristics that can be detected for example we will study in the future lectures uh, an experiment called Davison and Germer experiment where when you bombard an electron beam onto a crystal lattice you see certain kinds of diffraction we will also see the two slit interference experiment where electrons demonstrate interference in the same manner that light demonstrates interference in the Young's double state experiment. So when we go into the subatomic particle, then the momentum becomes so small that the wavelength becomes sufficiently large that it is detected by instruments. So you see this property. This property gives us an inverse correlation between the wave nature and the particle nature. Momentum being the particle nature, wavelength being the wave nature. So when we go into the macroscopic world, the momentum becomes so high that the wave nature is almost negligible. It, we don't really see it. But when we go into the microscopic domain, then the momentum becomes less and we actually do end up seeing wave characteristics. Which is interesting because not only light demonstrates dual nature, even electrons demonstrate dual nature of particles and waves, which is going to be our starting point of quantum mechanics. Because you see, one of the fundamental equations in quantum mechanics is the Schrodinger's equation. And Schrodinger himself said that when he was formulating the Schrodinger's equation, he took inspiration from the de Broglie hypothesis. I will not go so much into the detail right now. I will go in detail in the future videos. But yeah, the fundamental pillar of quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger's equation, was derived out of an inspiration from the de Broglie hypothesis. Now the question may be, where did de Broglie get his motivation? 
Well, one of the answers, of course, as I said, these uh, grand symmetry in our universe of matters and waves having this kind of a dual nature. Also, if I may add one last point before I finish this video, De Broglie was also heavily influenced or inspired by what is known as the uh, Bohr's condition of stability in atoms. When Niels Bohr gave his explanation for the orbital stability of an atom, he gave one rule. I won't go too much into the detail in the rule. I'll just mention it. He said that the angular momentum of an electron, which is revolving around the nucleus in an atom, is actually equal to integral multiple of h upon 2 pi. He gave this particular rule. And De Broglie was quite inspired by this particular rule because you see that what De Broglie suggested was that there is a certain occurrence of these kinds of periodicities whenever we are dealing with matter particles. You see, periodicity is something that arises whenever we deal with waves naturally, but it doesn't necessarily arise when we deal with particles. But in the atomic world, these kinds of periodicities, by periodicity I mean the n here, the integer, integral multiple of quantities, these things are arising when we are trying to explain the behavior of particles. So that means the particles are somehow connected with the motion of a wave. And I can explain that if we assume that the De Broglie hypothesis is true. Why? Because the angular momentum of an electron around a nucleus is given by mvr, mass of the electron, velocity of the electron around the nucleus in its orbit, radius of the orbit is equal to nh upon 2 pi. If I just rearrange the terms a little bit, we will see why the Bohr uh, postulate become famous and we will also see why the Broglie hypothesis makes sense. You see, if I take 2 pi r to this side, I end up getting 2 pi r is equal to n upon h upon mv. What is 2 pi r? If you look at an atom, all right, let's suppose that I have this atom, okay? And uh, this circle is the orbit of an electron around the nucleus. Let's suppose this is the nucleus. In that situation, 2 pi r represents the circumference, right? Circumference of the orbit. What is h upon mv? h upon mv is nothing but the de Broglie wavelength corresponding to the motion of the electron. So the circumference is actually equal to n times lambda where n has values of 1, 2, 3 and on and on. What does this mean? It means that if we draw an electron wave in the circumference, then the electron wave forms a standing wave pattern around the circumference, something like this. Let me try to draw and do justice to a wave. Yes, we are successfully able to create a fixed standing wave pattern on this circumference. So you see, if the electron has a de Broglie wave that can form a standing wave pattern at that circumference, then that corresponds to a stable orbit. If we have some other orbit where this standing wave pattern is not formed, then that would be an unstable orbit and it would not exist. So Bohr's condition of stability of an atom is directly correlated to Louis de Broglie's hypothesis of these matter waves. These matter waves of an electron form standing wave patterns around the orbit and only those orbits are allowed which are integral multiples of lambda uh, for the circumference. So you see, I have something for you which directly corroborates this idea of a wavelength of a matter wave. Anyways, that is all for today. Uh, this is a, a very interesting point to start our future lectures because now we know that particles have wave behavior. I'm going to do another video on the Davison and Germer experiment and two slit interference so that you are convinced that this is actually true via experimental results. This is nonetheless a very important turning point in the history of physics because this is where other scientists come to realize that physics as we know it previously is not sufficient. We need to create a new physics, a new theory that can 
explain all these kinds of bizarre behavior of light photons and electrons behaving like waves. Anyways, that is all for today. I am Divya Chotidas. I will see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.